All right, so Marcel, you're here? Yes, hello. Okay, so I maybe should then, uh, just to you know, fulfill my role as the moderator. Um, <laughs> so Marcel uh, works for Datev, a software architect there, um, and he's one of the brains behind uh, the uh, salary calculation DSL there. We have um, jointly built this years ago. Well, we started years ago. You're still working on it, obviously. And um, I guess, um, well, um, that's all I had. I will interrupt you with urgent questions and otherwise I'll collect questions till the end. Enjoy. Okay, so thank you, Markus, and hello out there. Um, my name is Marcel Riedel. Um, as Markus said, I'm a software architect at DATEV and um, I'm one of the um, developers who build and maintain the DSL for payroll calculations. And I'm very proud that I can you give some insights. And well, yeah, let's start. At first, I want to give you some uh, facts um, about DATEV, who we are. Well, we are a co cooperative uh, for lawyers, um, for tax advisors, and we are customers. And well, we are one of the largest IT um, companies uh, here in Germany and in Europe. Uh, now we have more than 8,000 uh, employees. And I guess we offer, well, I think more than 100 products to our clients. And one of the most important, um, the most important departments is the HR and payroll section. So uh, we process every month more than 13 million payroll slips. So that means uh, every, I guess, every fifth uh, employee here in Germany gets uh, its payroll slip from DATEV. But uh, calculating uh, the payroll isn't only uh, calculate what everyone gets paid, but we have uh, also have to transmit to more than 20 institutions and authorities data we need. So in total, uh, we transfer more than 170 million uh, data sets every year. What we are currently doing, uh, we are developing a completely new cloud-based payroll system and this uh, one uh, will replace uh, the existing payroll products, um, which are processing these payroll slips in the end. And the new payroll systems business logic will base on our DSL for payroll calculation, which you are gonna see uh, in some moments. Okay, so one could ask why did we, um, decide to use uh, these, uh, what were the aspects um, that made us decide? Uh, well, I think um, it's quite easy if you look at our domain and their complexities. Uh, we have um, very often the situation that law and uh, regulations want us to change um, our calculations and data structures uh, every year. And in well, pandemic uh, pandemic times like this, it's quite more often um, currently we are changing um, our calculations, um, I think every month or something like that. Um, what makes it even harder is that the logic we have to maintain is not only the logic for the current uh, year. We have to maintain uh, our business logic um, of the previous four years so uh, that uh, our customers can do corrections uh, so we can change um, any data for any employees or something like that. And uh, the um, calculations uh, of any uh, yeah, payroll slip which was created four years ago um, has to be rolled up again. The next, next thing is that uh, the German uh, legislation is uh, quite creative. Uh, so that means um, we have always a default calculation rule, which is might uh, mostly uh, quite easy. But 
we are always some strange cases and we always have a large uh, um, bunch of, of rules uh, we have to fulfill in our business logic. And last but not least, um, what it makes it even harder, um, Marcus um, told it uh, and showed it to you uh, some moments, moments ago, um, the data we have to maintain also has uh, have a temporal dimension, which means, uh, which means that uh, the salary changes over time, but it's not only the salary, almost every field uh, that uh, uh, is in the input uh, can be or has a temporal dimension. So if we um, calculate one specific month, we have to uh, check which uh, value is valid in this special month. Um, well, and that's all the things which uh, makes our domain quite complex. And um, as you might guess, uh, you have to uh, you need very much uh, you know, knowledge about the domain. And so it's a good idea, I think, that our domain experts um, can express uh, the business logic directly in a model like uh, um, MPS and uh, uh, offers and we use uh, a DSL for that. Okay. Um, but there are also some things uh, that leads us to a DSL, which are not um, only based to the business logic. We are also um, something, things that uh, makes it complex um, from a, from yeah, from the view of technology. Um, I think if we have, uh, or imagine we have more than 3000 fields uh, in the end, and uh, these one have to be validated. So um, it's necessary that parts of our business logic have to be executed both in the backend and in the UI. So, uh, but nobody wants to uh, maintain validation rules for 3000 fields twice. So uh, what we need is a, we need a single part of truth and that uh, can be a DSL model. Um, the other thing is a uh, distributed cloud appla uh, application system is a very complex thing itself. So we want to separate it uh, from our business logic, um, not to cr increase the complexity even more further. And the other thing is that um, frameworks and technologies are moving very fast in the sector of cloud computing. So what we want to have is a high flexibility regarding to the architecture and technology things so that we can change uh, frameworks and uh, use technology quite easy. Okay, so what we want to do now, now you know some things about uh, the payroll domain um, and, its, uh, and its complexities. What I want to show now, uh, show you now, is how we address these things in our DSL. And for this, um, I want to change to directly into our IDE. Uh, just one moment. Now, you will see. Um, you will see. Where is it? Here is it. Um, MPS and. Um, uh, example, um, a demo uh, example, which I created and uh, I want to show you some things in our DSL. Well, let's start. Um, our domain experts divide uh, the whole uh, domain into diff uh, different business areas. So what you can see here, we have uh, different models for each business area. For instance, the employee, um, the area of calculation salary, and uh, for instance, church tax and wage tax. Um, for this demo, I want to uh, concentrate on this uh, wage tax uh, business area, and I opened it here. Uh, it's a uh, well, we say it's a descriptor, which means it uh, gives you a summary of this um, business area wage tax. Um, what you see here, you see um, um, the dependent uh, 
um, business area uh, employee and salary, uh, salary, which is used to calculate the wage tax. And here you see uh, our versions. So in this case, we have three versions. Uh, the first one is valid from um, January of the year 2021. And I've added some more versions for the next two years. Um, it's not quite necessary that it's always, uh, always has to start in January. We always uh, can uh, have a, a version every month, I think. Okay. So now let's look into uh, one of these version and look what's going on here. Um, we have uh, um, a module which um, con has all the contents of this business area. And uh, as you can see, we have a quite fixed structure. We have here parameters, which are constants um, our domain experts can use for calculate, uh, calculating. Uh, we have a data area where they can uh, define objects uh, and uh, where attributes. For instance, we have here a text result object and it has a attribute uh, called text to pay. And we have a quite bunch of business uh, calculation rules uh, here in this uh, example, we've just, we just have, to, just have one um, calculation rule. Um, but uh, we can all, uh, of course, we can use some context actions and we add some more sections. For instance, if we need some uh, enumerations, we can add um, this uh, module part or um, if we have to deal with uh, any messages, we can uh, add a special part for messages. Um, so we can do all the things we need here in this module. So, but in this example, we don't need uh, enums. So I, um, okay. So now let's look what it's going, uh, what's, what is going on here. Um, Every result needs to have uh, a calculation rule, which uh, you can see here. We have um, uh, a calculation rule, which is named default. We can um, write here what we want to do. Um, it's just a name um, where we can find our um, calculation rules. And here in this area, we, we define the uh, dependencies we need in our calculations. And uh, we have in this case here, um, we can um, insert any conditions we uh, that uh, have to be fulfilled to execute this rule. Uh, in this easy um, example, we have just one rule, uh, which is um, executed always. And what it's going on here, we just uh, need, uh, we just calculate a fixed tax rate of 25% and uh, take this percentage from the salary, which comes from the salary um, business area. That's an um, expression we uh, build ourselves so um, that our uh, domain experts can easily uh, or can use uh, percentage and expressions for percentages uh, more easily. Uh, what you can see here too, we have a rounding expression also. Um, in this case, uh, we round half up. We can choose if uh, we round up, down or half up. And we round half up uh, two uh, digits behind uh, this decimal point. And well, that's it here. So what we do next. Um, I'll open the tests. So um, we can see it here. Um, our domain experts, um, of course, want to test the uh, business logic way, um, want to uh, way we write it down where you want to test them. And here we, we can set up test setup. In this case, we uh, created an employee, uh, uh, which is called Max. And this employee has uh, some attributes, name, the birthday and address. And of course he has a salary uh, too. And this salary object um, is associated with uh, the, um, well, with the employee. And what's 
special in here, we have not um, a fixed uh, data. We also have some variables which we can use uh, to define more uh, test cases with this setup. So if you look down here, we have a check. And if we um, want to execute which um, uh, we can check uh, the month uh, that in this case, we want to see what uh, is calculated in January in 2021. And let's execute it. And in this case, we assume that uh, at with a salary of 2000 euro, 25% uh, of this um, um, will result in a tax to pay of 400 euros. And let's execute and well, we see uh, test case is correct. And the first one where is an error because um, we um, assumed that the result has to be 400, but, uh, but it was 500 euros. So what our domain experts um, are doing next, we used the tracer Marcus showed uh, moments ago. So I do that also. And you can see here um, this um, um, Trace Explorer. You can see uh, the two tests. The second one is this one. Um, and the first one is marked as failurehaft, which means this, that there's an error inside. So I open it. And what we can do now is that we um, jump down all the things and uh, we can insert the values here inside and display it directly in our business logic. And we can see here, we calculated 25 of uh, 2000 euro, fixed text rate is 25, the salary was 2000 euro. And of course, this has to be 500 euros. So there was an error in this test. So, and if we correct it, and um, for I'll enter it again, uh, you see now all, all our tests are green. Okay, let's do a narrow step and go further. I let's assume we have an uh, change in the law that the tax decreases from 25 uh, to uh, 20 percent luckily and uh, for instance um, employees who are born before 1960 only have to pay half of the taxes so what we have to do now is that we have to go into the new uh, version which is valid from january of 2022 and well well it's quite empty, this version. Um, what's going on there? We, what we are doing here, we are inherit uh, all the contents from the previous version. And we um, show it up here. If we um, check this, uh, click this checkbox, um, which means uh, that all inherited stuff from the previous version will show up. You can see now that um, the fixed tax rate of 25% is still valid. And um, the calculation rule we've seen moments before is also valid too. So let's change now this um, tax rate. Um, one way is to write it down, but we can also use some intentions. We can copy it with this intention um, into the current version. So now we can change the tax rate as I said, from 20% to 20, uh, from, from 10 to 5% to 20%. And um, the next thing is that we add new calculation rule. Let's say it's named born before 1960. And to check um, if this uh, rule can be executed, we need the employee. Um, let's at the uh, this dependency and of course we need uh, the salary dependency to calculate x so 
oh, we add the condition um, uh, in the case, uh, this case we say that the birthday has to be before um, and now we can insert all the expressions we like, um, for instance, um, um, decision tables, trees, alternatives, all the stuff um, Marcus showed up uh, in his talk. Uh, for now, I want to just copy this expression we used in the other rule and say that it's just half of the tax we have to pay in this case. So, uh, we have an error. Um, of course, I forgot to set the uh, tax uh, result we want to calculate. And if we go now here, we can. Um, check um, the test and uh, we have two cases. Uh, one case is, uh, is uh, that we have a salary of 2000 euro and the employee's birthday is in 1990. And in the other case uh, with the same salary, we have the employee's birthday set to 1950. So uh, evaluate it and we see um, in the first case, we executed the old rule, um, which uh, is inherited from the version of the year before, but is still valid in 2022. And the other rule um, is executed uh, here in this case. So you see here, um, if we show the tracer um, and get to the second, um, test, you see here uh, that we execute this uh, new calculation rule. Okay. There is a question, Marcel. Okay. Yes, Marcus. It says there must be an ordering of rules, more specific override, less specific. Is that part of your DSL, part of kernel F or part of MPS or where's the magic? Uh, yeah, it's part of our DSL. Um, we have a, a thing called rule finder and um, which um, says that uh, we at first check um, the rules in the current version um, if uh, the conditions are fulfilled and if there's one um, condition fulfilled we execute the rules. Uh, we um, um, we throw an error if there are more than one rules can be executed, but there's one um, another rule um, that says that if we don't find any specific rule um, which can be executed, then uh, we execute the default rule instead. So right. So that's, yes, I, I remember when when we built this, we were uh, considering integrating a solver that would check that there is always full coverage of all possible values, but without overlap. And yes. that could then also potentially be used to uh, determine which of the conditions is narrower or more specific and then try that first. Or if you have no overlap, then this isn't even a problem. But um, we have not integrated this solver. The reason is um, <laughs> mainly because uh, we wanted, as part of this research project, we wanted to integrate a solver with all of kernel F. And assuming we would have managed to do that, it should have been easy to integrate it into this DSL. Unfortunately, it was much harder. We didn't manage to do that. And so there is no solver in your DSL, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> A solver would be very great, and well, if you guys from Etamus <laughs> get <laughs> anything uh, in this case, uh, we would use it. <laughs> yeah, or if there's a volunteer who wants to add a solver to kernel. Um, all right, I'm dropping <laughs> out again. Okay, so uh, let's go a step further. Um, what I want to show you, um, we also use um, the visualization stuff um, to show up our dependencies. So our domain experts can go here and visualize um, the 
uh, objects um, in this business area and uh, which um, data and which objects uh, we need to be calculated. In this case, we have a result called text result and this needs the employee, of course, for checking the birthday and the salary for calculating the tax. Okay, and uh, our domain experts uh, can use it for discussing um, where we can export it as a, a, a image or what's also quite nice uh, if we can copy it and uh, I'll open up an editor and as you see, we create an uh, blunt UML code behind and well, you can insert it into uh, any Git issues or something like that, uh, which render uh, up these things and well, or you can model it uh, and go further. Well, it's quite nice. Okay. The last thing I want to show you here in uh, MPS is here in our third uh, version of this wage tax um, business area. So um, what we are doing here, we uh, replaced this calculation rule with something other. Um, so let's talk about this one. Um, the German Ministry of Finance um, always publishes uh, the algorithm to calculate um, wage taxes in an XML file. And in our old products, um, we will re-implement re that algorithm and that's always um, quite an, yeah, quite much work and we have to test it and well, that's nothing we want to do in our new product. So we take, uh, we took this um, XML file and converted it to Java and what we did, uh, we insert that char file here in our language and make it uh, accessible to our domain expert. So we can um, execute this, um, well, external, externally hosted uh, Java runtime, uh, Java program, I would say, um, if we call here just this uh, language thing. We have to um, fill the input data which is quite much because uh, this uh, algorithm is uh, quite complicated. Um, and then we can execute it and get you know, some results and use it further um, in our model. So, and we also can test it, of course. Uh, I'll open the test again. And what we, s we are seeing here, if we go to the third check with, uh, which uh, runs the um, calculation in the year 2023. We can execute it and behind um, our interpreter calls the um, Java char file and um, execute it with the data which is uh, inserted here and um, gets the results and uses it um, for testing and of course we can use it further on. Okay, so that's the things. Uh, it's a quite uh, little overview about our DSL. We have done uh, some more things, but I think it's uh, going too far for this. Um, so let's go back to the um, presentation. So, okay. Um, now, um, okay, after you have now an idea um, how our domain experts um, do their work in our DSL, let's talk about what is going on with the model. What are, do, are we doing with it? Um, as you saw um, that uh, our domain experts uh, do their business related changes to the model where you add and run the tests on the model with the interpreter and after all is green um, we just git push it and then our ci server um, does the java generation of the model and the test and that makes us 
um, uh, enables us to run the tests on the generated code. And that means if uh, the CI server says that all tests are running green, uh, it means that the generated code acts uh, the same way than our model um, did in MPS. So the next thing is uh, that uh, our CI server publishes um, the generated artifacts to our binary repository, and then our software engineer just integrate the artifacts uh, with, uh, well, refreshing the uh, Maven dependencies. Um, in a typical change of uh, or a typical change of business logic uh, means that in most cases there aren't any necessary things we have to do uh, in the infrastructure or we don't need to add any new integration test. We just uh, can git push it again and then our CI server uh, builds the microservice and once integration, uh, integration tests and deploy it uh, uh, all the microservice to our cloud and you can execute it in our yeah in a browser or something like that so that means there isn't very much uh, manual work to integrate uh, the generated artifacts and maybe this can be automated too if there are no changes to the infrastructure so it's a quite nice thing if you want uh, to have a typical change of business logic, logic fast uh, deploying into the cloud. Okay. In the last part of um, this talk, I wanna give you some advice and tell you some lessons learned about developing and maintaining a DSL. Um, let's start with the project, uh, project settings. Um, I think it's quite necessary that you should be at least three person or maybe more uh, in a team that deals exclusively with building a DSL. Um, it doesn't work if you develop it uh, initially um, per in parallel to day-to-day -day business because it's quite a hard work. But um, a good tip is that you um, let you help um, of consultants um, like Itemis. Um, that's with their help, the first steps are quite easier. But what's really important is that you try to initiate the transfer of the knowledge um, quite in an early stage uh, of a project. Um, we are at our um, payroll. Um, division while well, we um, developed the D DSL initially with Itemis, I think, um, well, half year or maybe some month more, where um, Itemis did uh, most of the work and we are, well, pairing partners or um, um, looked what we are doing and learned from them. And after some months, uh, after we did trainings and, and um, get all the knowledge we need, uh, we, we changed it so that uh, we are in charge and uh, invo evolved uh, our DSL and Itamus was there or and still is there for uh, any problems we have, uh, um, any new things we want to do and uh, uh, we are well quite a consultant and um, that's a really very good solution I think. Um, well, the last thing is also a truth. I think DSL and Scrum can really be friends. Um, what we did, we, we did um, develop a DSL quite, um, just with a basic feature set. We didn't uh, create a feature complete um, DSL upfront uh, because it wasn't ne necessary. Um, we and Wolf evolved together um, our DSL together with the model and it works. Um, you have to do some prioritization um, and um, have to take care uh, the relevant things and but uh, that's maybe hard to decide what to do next but it works. 
So let's say some words to kernel F and the things Marcus told us moments ago. I think for a commer commercial DSL project like uh, we are, um, kernel F is really a blessing because you get an out of the box uh, complete language. Uh, you can do all the things with expressions. You can, um, well, um, define the whole world in kernel F and, and you can test it with an interpreter and you have a Java generator. Generator, you can um, uh, generate all the things you need. Um, so kernel F makes us to um, get a quicker startup and to, well, to have a lower initial invest. Um, and that's a great thing. But what you have to do, um, you, um, it's not a good idea to, to get kernel F and use it itself and don't find any um, higher abstraction, um, which, which makes your language domain specific. Um, as Marcus told us, um, there are complex um, expressions like list transformation, option handling, lambda expressions, and these are all the things that um, yeah, might be difficult to understand for our domain experts or business programmers. So uh, my advice is that you look closely at your domain and find higher abstraction, uh, abstraction levels and um, build really build a language on top of kernel F, which is, uh, so you can really say it's a domain specific language. Okay, the editor is quite uh, important. Functionality is the one thing, um, but uh, your uh, domain experts will only be happy if you, you have a good and intuitive user experience. And in this case, you have to compete with uh, Word and Excel or all the tools uh, these people use day by day. And um, it's a quite hard work to get uh, a good user experience in the editor. Uh, or if you, if, um, if you have a complex um, language uh, or editor structures like dynamic tables or so, something like that, it's um, not that easy to get uh, a good experience. And this is often an expense driver and uh, well, that's hard work, but it's also can be a, a projection, a projector can be a blessing too. So um, you can represent um, every information um, the, the way you like um, and your um, domain experts like. Um, and what you can also do, um, all the things which are hidden um, in behind of the language or any magical uh, things that the language does for you and your domain experts um, can become more transparent if you invest in a good editor and you show up um, the things um, which are done behind. So um, what you have to do is that you uh, domain experts have to become a business programmer. So you have to stay connected with the domain experts. Um, what we are doing is we are regularly doing workshops, um, offering pairing sessions and help them just to do a job because um, domain experts know the domain and we are uh, the uh, language engineers and we know the language and we, if we connect this, um, it's um, quite good for everyone. Domain experts can um, easily or can express their business logic more easily and we learn what, uh, how our business uh, or how our domain experts um, use our DSL. Um, if you, um, if we um, implement new features or make changes to language, um, we always um, make uh, example projects or screencasts or something like that. So we can teach um, our domain experts. And the last one, um, the last dot here um, is also really important. Pay attention um, how your 
domain experts use the DSL. And um, then you will see all the issues in the usability you have to fix because that are the things uh, that are annoying your users because uh, if we are um, working with your DSL every day and uh, have every day the same usability issues, that's really annoying, I think. Okay, and now my last slide. I think domain experts really like to be responsible um, of uh, responsible of the business logic and its, its correctness. Um, we, we have the knowledge, we um, wrote it down in, in Word or Excel sheets uh, in former times. So now we are able to do the things directly in the model and we can execute it, um, look if it's correct and the things which are generated out of a model directly are you are used directly in um, the well in the system in the program or something like that. So um, it's a real value they can create here. Um, what's also true is that we are struggle sometimes with Git, for instance, uh, for resolving any merge conflicts and something like that, but. Um, of course, we are thankful for getting um, help um, and uh, for having, uh, if we have any problems like Git issues or something in the, um, well, in the usability of um, the DSL. And if you look at the software engineers, um, we are really happy not to be responsible of the business logic and their correctness. Uh, we don't want to, um, program uh, with thousands uh, of if and else or case switch um, 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 conditions uh, and all the things which are well in uh, well suited inside the business logic um, um, what we uh, noticed that we always struggle uh, with handling breaking changes uh, which uh, come with changes of the domain model and its consequences to the infrastructure but um, in this case we uh, maybe uh, improve the language or the things we we generate out of a model and so um, we are gonna solve this problem I guess in the near future and um, last but not least um, we are really thankful for every language and generator feature that makes their work easier so we can uh, concentrate on the well infrastructure things and cloud things and all the complex stuff uh, um, we have to deal with. So with these words, I want to say thank you for your attention and well, I'm looking for, forward to your questions. All right, thank you very much, uh, Marcel. Um, I have collected a couple of questions from the talk. The first one, remember when you were showing the versioning and the rules override where we discussed the yep. ordering? There was a follow on question. In practice, does this cause problems, i.e. bugs, for the domain-specific authors? Do they understand it? Sorry, I didn't uh, hear it right. This um, rule ordering, the execution mm -hmm. that you talked about, is yeah. this understandable to domain experts or does this uh, create bugs because they misunderstand how it works? Um, well, I think at first it's a little bit complicated, yes. Um, but um, what our domain experts can do, we, we can um, create a test and uh, with the tests, we can easily check uh, how the rules are executed, and that makes it um, easier for them to uh, to understand how um, it works. So, I don't think it's a hard problem currently. Yeah, there is also this issue that um, you have inheritance between the versions. And I remember initially it was hard for domain experts to understand what uh, uh, inheritance means. And one way we solved this was by, in a new version, 
projecting in the stuff from the previous version that was not overridden. So yeah. you would always see the total set of stuff that executes optionally. You can switch this off. So that's a pattern we've used in several DSLs to kind of demystify what inheritance means. Yeah, I think what's quite important is that uh, domain experts can see um, or, to, or get a few of what uh, is valid in a specific time. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the next question was, how do the users get the latest version of their custom MPS IDE? Is it for every change or based on a cumulative set of changes? I guess well, the word is releases right, that, that he's missing. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, we are working um, Scrum-based and have a two-week um, sprint and um, we deploy regularly uh, a new uh, or publish regularly a new uh, language version. And what we have built, we have a, um, uh, a tool uh, called DSL Launcher, and this checks up if there is a new um, version of our RCP, um, um, which is a, well, uh, uh, MPS uh, with less feature set, um, um, you know, uh, and the, um, these elements check, checks if there is a new version of RCP or the language version. And um, if there is something new, it shows up to our domain experts and they can install the new version. So it's quite easy for them to install a new um, language. It's probably also worth mentioning for those um, who are new to MPS that if you create a new version of a language and ship it, um, you can also ship migration scripts so that if you make incompatible structural changes, um, the models are automatically kind of pulled along um, and are migrated as users open up their models. Um, another question, um, but it goes in that direction. As, DSL, as the DSL grows, do the domain experts go back and redo um, existing business rules, or how how does this work when you release new features? Well, one thing is uh, to implement any migration scripts, uh, scripts but um, the other thing is if you teach them new uh, ways uh, how to express any business logic, uh, we, we have to refactor, of course. And um, what we are doing, we are connect. We are connected with each other. I think we have a meeting every two or three weeks uh, where we discuss new things um, and how we can um, um, express it um, in the language. Uh, we discuss new to, new um, language features and uh, we suggest what we can do in the existing model to get this better. So. It's there's no automation that uh, we are do the refactor uh, ring from for itself uh, or for themselves. You have to teach them to refactor. Hmm. So last question, I think um, a question from me actually. Um, so there are these DSLs that are intended for programmers, right? They basically are libraries with syntax, technical stuff. Um, that's not what you're doing. In your case, uh, the users are uh, business programmers or you know, salary law analysts kind of people. And on the other hand, you have the technical people who build the whole cloud stuff. And then yes. you have the language team. So from your perspective, would you say this separation of business programmer, analyst, kind of DSL user on the one hand side and the technical people works? You you, you alluded to a little bit by saying the, the ones are happy that they don't have to care about technology and so, but how would you, would you summarize it? Is that an idea that can work? Um, I think it can work because um, you have a model um, where all the business stuff is, is um, expressed there. Um, and with this model, you can discuss uh, with each other. Um, I think it's not interesting to a software engineer uh, what's going on in some special case, uh, any 
specific uh, business rule, but um, we of course need to know um, so the big picture, what's going on in this salary thing, and um, with yeah. um, with the model and um, the visualizations, um, you can bring um, domain experts and software engineers a little bit together, yeah. and it's a you have now a language um, both know and uh, both can know and both can talk about it. Yeah, so it's a precise artifact about which to disagree. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's actually a follow-on question here. What's the professional background of your language users? Are they, quote, simply tax accountants or do they have technical background? Well, um, it's... I guess some of them um, come from our old uh, or from our existing payroll products, and um, in these cases, we come in touch with uh, modeling and um, yeah, logical things and something like that. So we are not completely new to expressing um, business logic to uh, in a. Um, yeah, in a way, in a language or something like that. So, um, well, yes, our ones are so completely you... new, and it's um, of course harder for them if yeah. they have no so logical background. Maybe that's also worth saying that the, although this DSL is relatively new, uh, developed for a few years now, the idea yeah. of separating business programmers from a technical staff has a long tradition at DATEV, not just in your department, also in the in the in the, in the tax uh, department. Um, so, so in that sense, people are used to some degree of call, quote programming. Yeah. There's another follow-on question. Um, so, if something goes wrong, if you have a bug, um, how do you then triage it? Is it um, go to how do you decide which bugs um, you kind of assign to business experts and which are bugs of technology people or do you look at them jointly or how do you do that or do you maybe maybe you don't have bugs because of DSL. No. <laughs> no? never we have never bugs <laughs> i can't answer this question we have no bugs <laughs> yeah. well um it's up to the error i think um i think a good way to uh, analyze bugs is to um, look which data has been processed and um, just um, make a new test case um, in the DSL and with these uh, values and uh, then you might see if uh, it's calculating the right way or it's anything wrong. So um, in other cases, of course, you have to debug it um, the software engineer has to debug it maybe together with the domain expert and we look um, what's going on there. Um, it's in this, um, sometimes it's also uh, can be uh, an error in the generator. So the software engineer has to deal with uh, us as a language engineer and we have to debug together. So it's not that clear. Um, that uh, every bug um, has to be treated the same way. Yeah. Maybe there's one thing I, I can add. Um, typically, the, the way it works in theory, right, is if, if the tests in the interpreter are green, then you know you've not made a mistake on the business level, if you will. And then, of course, the same tests are run in the generated Java version. If something fails there, then it's probably usually the generator because the business expert already said the test is fine and it's green. The the other thing, I think, I'm not sure, we talked about it back then, not sure if you've built it in the meantime, if um, an actual customer reports a bug because an actual calculation in your generated Java with real data produces something that's wrong. I think we re we talked at the time about being able to lock the trace of the calculation in the generated Java and then overlay it over the computation in the same way as the interpreter does. Have you built this in the meantime? Uh, no, not yet, because okay. uh, we are not uh, in, in production with our whole um, 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 payroll product. So um, this is a thing we have to um, think about. Um, when we go next uh, 
to the production. All right. Okay, so I have no more question. There, there, there. Well, there is one more that says, "Do you re recommend that a, a, by, a baseline for every project involves kernel F?" I'm not sure if that's uh, targeted to you, Marcel, or to me. Um, I would say, <laughs> if you have a DSL that has functional basic expressions, yes. Otherwise, no. I mean, if if you don't need, then then you don't need it. Um, Right. Yeah, I, I think uh, I would. I can recommend uh, using kernel F and building something um, uh, around, and it's the way we want to go, and uh, we are uh, sure that it's uh, a right way for us, uh, the right way for us, and I guess it can be the right way for others too. Maybe I can give a completely unbiased empirical answer, which is since uh, since since we've built kernel F, I have not built a DSL that did not that doesn't use it. But again, I, I might be slightly biased. <laughs> All right, Marcel, thank you very much. Um, I think this thank was a, a great talk, both standing alone, but also as a kind of continuation of the of my kind of theoretical kernel F story before. So thanks for that. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much.